Hey, we have a lot of uh, uh, ground to cover, so if we could have some quiet, that would be great. Um, my name is Richard Ash. I'm uh, the co-chair of the Land Use Committee, Community Board 7. Uh, we are meeting jointly with the Housing Committee. Nick Prego is the chair, and I, I, I imagine transportation. With Andrew Albert. Hmm? Holly Smith um, And uh, let me tell you, if I can, what we are covering tonight and what we're not doing tonight. This meeting really is an informational meeting for uh, the board and the community to learn what plans the city has for these garages. Um, it is an opportunity for everybody to hear what the plans are uh, and an opportunity to uh, sort of weigh in and, um, and discuss what will happen to the cars who are parked, that are parked in the garage after, uh, if the buildings are torn down. Uh, so we're going to start first with a presentation by the uh, by Wishfish and by the city, and um, and then we're going to uh, ask board members if they have any questions of a factual nature to ask them, uh, and then we're going to open the floor up to comment. Um, one of the things that we've developed, one of the techniques we've developed over the years uh, to avoid spending all night in a meeting is that if there a if there's a spokesperson for a particular point of view uh, the person should identify himself or herself uh, will give that person extra time to speak and then uh, other people who may have signed up to speak or or rate one of their opinions heard if they agree with a prior speaker uh, it doesn't help us to say, to have the same speech 200 times uh, you can, if you wish to say, I agree with the prior speaker, that would be appreciated. Uh, at the end of the evening, we will uh, call for a show of hands as to who is in favor and who is opposed, uh, so that your presence will be acknowledged. Uh, but um, it, it, it really doesn't help anybody to have redundant speeches. Um, also, if anyone has questions, of a factual nature, when board members are finished asking their questions, uh, we'll recognize those individuals first. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going the the proposed developers wish fish, which is the West Side Federation for uh, Senior and Supportive Housing, uh, and uh, we have. Uh, individual from Wishfish here as well as uh, individuals from the city um, H from HPD which owns the property. Uh, so we're going to turn it over to them. We expect that the presentation will not be lengthy um, and uh, I started to say that one of the things we're not doing tonight is we're not voting. This is an informational meeting only. So um, you know this may be a long hard slog but that's the way we do things like to be fully informed before we vote. The vote will occur possibly in a couple of months uh, and everybody will get notice of when and where. All right? Okay. Yeah, Paul. Thank you, oh. Richard. Laura Bye. first. We can uh, come back to you with information that you requested at the December information meeting that we had uh, before the Land Use Committee. So the two issues that we're talking about today, uh, tonight, are um, a proposal for rezoning the site and uh, the parking. So my name is Laura Jervis. I retired as the executive director from Wisfish in September. And I'm very um, happy that with me is Paul Freitag, who of course is the executive director of Wisfish. And I have to say uh, publicly it's been a very smooth transition um, under Paul's leadership and the, he, um, he didn't have to embrace the values of Wisfish because he had the values of Wisfish. He came with them. So um, it's, um, it, it's a very good feeling for me personally and I'm very grateful to him and to the board of Wisfish for making such a good choice. 
So my role is really to set a little bit about the context of why this development and to um, give you a little bit of a history. Uh, some board members may not uh, be as acquainted with WISFISH as others. So a little bit of history. Um, WISFISH was organized 40 years ago in December of 1976 and it was organized to respond to the plight of poor, older people, senior citizens on the west side, especially those who were living in single room occupancy hotels. It was organized here in Community Board 7 by religious uh, institutions and community organizations. Uh, and it, the purpose was to provide housing for older adults that was safe and affordable. So we very quickly put up our first two buildings. Some of you may know them. Uh, the first was the renovation of the Hotel Marseille on 103rd Street and Broadway, which opened in 1980. And the second was Red Oak Apartments, which is right across the street from Jewish Home, which is new construction. Um, 134 apartments at Marseille, 230 at Red Oak. So then in the early 1980s, when the explosion of homelessness occurred on the west side. Some of you who were here at that time will remember women uh, being sheltered at night in the vestibules of stores with all their worldly goods around them. People began calling us at Wispish and saying, what can you do about this? And so it was at that time that we uh, expanded the mission to include permanent housing for homeless people and we created Valley Lodge. And Valley Lodge is a shelter. It's the only shelter that Wisfish has. The board said one shelter, everything else, affordable housing. And it is the centerpiece of the development we're talking about tonight. One more general comment, uh, Wisfish employs over 350 people. We uh, have 24 buildings, 1,800 tenants. Twelve of those buildings are in Ward 7. So if I could have um, a slide, I'll just give you a little bit of an orientation. This, of course, is the aerial slide. I hope everyone can see it. Um, you'll see the, the um, why don't we go to the second one, Vanessa? I think it's a little, it might be a little easier. So this is the existing 108th Street. To the left, of course, is Amsterdam. To the east is Columbus. And you'll see, uh, beginning at the west side, uh, parking garage, Valley Lodge, which we opened in 1988, uh, is next. Then an another garage, and then all then the uh, Annabelle Avalis playground, and then finally the third Easterly garage. So a word about Valley Lodge: it is a shelter for older adults, 50 and over. 92 women and men who come through the City Department of Homeless Services assessment program. Um, 92 people with um, frail medical conditions as well as mental health conditions. The staff is 45 people to the 92 uh, residents. It's 24 hours. It has been a safe haven for the children who come out of the middle school, Booker T. Washington, it's right across there from the playground. So Valley Lodge, um, again, we've been operating it for 28 years. We own that property. We have um, housed in permanent housing appropriate to their needs uh, almost 2,000 people since um, 1988. We average with a population of 92, we average about 60 to 65 people move out every year and go into permanent housing. Some of it with fish, some of it other kinds of housing. Um, so our proposal to you is to uh, tear down the garages and Valley Lodge, replace it with a new Valley Lodge that will be a bit of an increase in beds, 110 beds, and then um, create the rest it as permanent housing. And we'll go into that, uh, others will go into that a, a bit more uh, in detail. 
So that is the first phase of the project. And the permanent housing will have 78 apartments for uh, zero, one, two, and three bedrooms. They still got three bedrooms in there. Um, affordable housing for um, people who meet the income guidelines. And then we will have 115 units of supportive housing. That's phase one. Phase two is the most easterly garage. Um, that will come later, and uh, we're proposing 75 units of housing for senior citizens. So that's kind of the lay, the overlay of the land. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paul to talk about urban design. Paul, by the way, is an architect, which is a, a big bonus in this work. <laughs> However, I'll be introducing actually the architect for the project, and that is not me. Um, so um, I just want to say I just had my six-month anniversary of working at Wisfish, and it's been fantastic. I mean, it's, it's an amazing organization, and it's, every day has been inspiring for me you know, coming to work at Wisfish. Um, my entire career has been working with affordable housing. I spent over a dozen, a dozen years with Catholic Charities, and so I, I feel very much at home in Wisfish and very inspired by their mission. Um, the other story I'd like to tell is that during my first six weeks at Wisfish, I, I wanted to visit all 24 buildings. And I said, okay, where do I start? And I was told the very first building you must visit is Valley Lodge. That when you go to Valley Lodge and you walk through the doors, you see the sort of physical manifestation of Wisfish's mission. You know, it's sort of where it all begins. It's where people have come in off the street, are sort of learning to stabilize their lives, and eventually you know, move through the continuum of moving through supportive and affordable housing. And so I went, to, I went to Valley Lodge actually with Laura and on my first day of work. I met Karen Jorgensen, who has been the director of Valley Lodge since the day it opened. Um, she can tell you almost by name every person who has come through Valley Lodge and moved on to permanent housing. And, and it really is an inspiring place and a place I thought a lot about during these first six months. So um, to introduce sort of I think the idea behind this meeting, we had our first informational, uh, first informational meeting with the Land Use Committee of Community Board 7 back in December. And at that point, we brought a model, it was a much smaller meeting, and the, the, mo the meeting really centered with people sort of looking at the models. We presented different options and discussed them. Um, we knew there would be a bigger crowd here today, and so what we've done is we actually have photographed the model, and as Bill Stein, the architect for the project, um, talks about different options using the model, um, it will be projected up on the screen as well, sort of what, what he's showing, so that everybody should be able to see that. Um, so actually, I, I will hand over to Bill at this point, maybe to talk a little bit about some of the unique uh, design features and urban design issues on 108th Street. Uh, thank you, Paul. My name is Bill Stein. I'm an architect with Danner Architects, and we're the architectural firm working with Wistfish on this project. Um, again, this is a site plan. It's just another view of the um, uh, aerial photograph that was on the previous slide showing the uh, uh, starting from the left or the west nearest to Amsterdam Avenue, the uh, garage, again owned by HPD, Valley Lodge, owned and operated by Wispish, next to another city-owned garage, the playground, and then to the east nearest uh, Columbus, uh, what we're calling Phase 2 or Building 2, the third uh, city-owned garage. Uh, many of you are familiar with the context, but this is a unique block on the uh, west side, on the upper west side, in that there's actually very little existing residential. Across the street from us is a large soccer field and uh, playing field, as well as a school. And on the uh, um, north side of the street, uh, where these sites are, are the garages and Valley Lodge. The only residential buildings are really at the corners of Columbus and Amsterdam. So it's kind of a, uh, uh, not the typical lively uh, residential uh, street frontage of the Upper West Side. And one of the goals of the project, in addition to providing the uh, uh, affordable and supportive housing that we'll talk about, is to really enliven the streetscape and make it a more integral part of the community. Uh, so here's a model, and I realize you can't all see the model. Maybe at the end of the meeting, you can all pass by. Uh, what's shown in the model are the existing garages with uh, Valley Lodge in the middle. I don't have a laser pointer, so I won't be able to point to them. Uh, you see the white uh, um, pieces in the model are representative of trees in, in the playground. 
and you see the school across the street as well as the playing field and, and many of the surrounding buildings on, on the surrounding blocks. Now if we go to the uh, next slide. So the existing, uh, the zoning of the site is currently R8B. It's a contextual zone. There are limits on what's called floor area ratio, which is the amount of floor area that you can build as well as on the height of the building. So this, is, this diagram is not really a design, but it's a, really a diagram of what can be built as of right uh, under the R8B uh, existing zoning. And this allows essentially a seven-story building setting back at the sixth floor and then going up to seven floors and would accommodate um, approximately 190 units. In the west building, the longer building uh, to the west or towards Amsterdam Avenue, 145 uh, apartments, including 60 affordable and 85 supportive apartments. And in the second phase, the building to the right or towards Columbus, uh, 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 45 units of uh, senior housing. Uh, in addition, the rebuilt Valley Lodge would uh, provide 110 shelter beds, an increase from the existing 92 in, in the existing uh, Valley Lodge. So uh, the total project would be 110 transitional beds and 199 units of affordable and supportive housing in this, as of right, R8B um, uh, scenario. So what led the, the thought that led to uh, a possible rezoning to R8A, which is also a contextual district, but allows a higher floor area ratio and more floor area, as well as uh, a higher building, uh, was the mission of Wisfish to accommodate as much affordable and supportive housing as possible on these sites. Obviously, these are very, very valuable sites, and uh, an opportunity like this does not arise uh, at all frequently, and, and the mission of Wisfish in serving the community is to provide as much affordable housing as possible. So, if we go to the next slide, I'm not gonna, since most of you can't see it, I'm not gonna put the uh, different model um, but I'll just hold this up. This was the R8B model, and I can just take these off here, fitting in like this. Again, I apologize that not all of you can see this clearly. This next scheme was uh, the, uh, a so-called uh, limited uh, R8A scheme, and I'll explain that in a moment. And this was a scheme that we presented to the committee in December. And uh, this scheme, when we say limited FAR R8A, it's a mouthful, but essentially what we're proposing to do is take advantage of the height uh, limits that uh, an R8A district uh, affords as well as some of the additional floor area, but not all. We are not proposing to build to the maximum uh, and not to the uh, maximum height either. So for example, uh, an R8A district uh, allows up to a 6.5 FAR um, uh, uh, floor area. We're proposing to use approximately 5.2 to 5.3 FAR. So it's real, what we're really proposing is that kind of midway between the existing R8B zoning and what a full R8A would allow. And similarly, we're trying to moderate the height. So the scheme we showed in, in December to the committee was a building that stepped down from a higher building towards Amsterdam, which was 11 stories, the highest uh, portion of, that, uh, of what's shown in the model, down to a nine-story section, and then down to a uh, seven-story section that was right next to the uh, playground. And similarly, the uh, second phase building would be an 11-story building with, with a setback at the uh, seventh floor. And uh, as Laura said earlier, this, uh, this limited RAA option would keep Valley Lodge at 110 beds, same as under the as of right uh, scenario, no increase in the, in the transitional beds, but an increase of 78 permanent housing units from 190 to 268 units, so that the West Building would have 100, 193 apartments including 78 
affordable apartments and 115 supportive housing studios. The east building, the phase two building towards uh, Columbus would contain 75 senior uh, affordable apartments. In addition, this option, in addition to allowing more apartments, this option allows us to provide more larger family apartments. So for example, in the as of right scenario, we can provide 12 two bedroom apartments, whereas in this modified option, we can provide uh, uh, 30 two bedroom apartments. Similarly, there's an increase in the number of three bedroom apartments. So having gotten uh, very useful commentary from the committee, we uh, have studied the project further and developed a modified proposal that still uses some of the increased height and floor area that's afforded by a rezoning to R8A. And what we are now proposing is a, is a design that looks something like this. And basically what we've done here is we've modified the design so that the portion of the building that fronts on the street is lower to create a more friendly pedestrian scale. So again, starting from the west towards Amsterdam or the left on the screen, we have a seven story section that steps up in, the, in sort of in the middle to a, a nine story section and then next to the park down to a six-story section. By the way, in this scheme as in the previous scheme, the building is not straight along the street frontage. It, uh, the first section to the west is on the street line, then the, the middle section steps back five feet, and the third section, the lower six-story section, is, is 10 feet from the street line. This allows for a better uh, sequence of entrances to the building, uh, as well as a planting uh, strip in front of the building to, again, create a friendly streetscape, as well as defer and lead people's vision into the open space of a playground. Uh, the other advantage of this scheme, in addition provide to providing more housing, it enables us to improve and enhance the common spaces and community facility spaces that will be located on the ground floor of the building, uh, so that we uh, Wispish will be able to provide more services both to the residents of the building as well as to the larger community. And uh, here's another view. Uh, so again, uh, at the street line, seven, nine, and six stories, and then a setback section that is uh, 11 stories that enables us to accommodate the number of apartments that I mentioned. And you see the, that 11 story setback section uh, uh, in this photograph of the model. Another thi thing that this proposal ha uh, offers is that uh, while this is obviously a higher building than the existing buildings on the site or than the as of right uh, building we mentioned, this proposal provides a generous rear yard. The current garages extend almost the full depth of the lot, approximately 90 feet out of the 100 foot depth of the lot. So there's very little separation between the uh, buildings uh, uh, on 109th Street and the existing garages. You can see, again, I don't have a pointer, but you can see there between the garages and the rear of the 109th Street buildings, a very narrow, roughly 20 foot space. Um, between those buildings and with this uh, proposal you see here the that space would be approximately 50 feet uh, uh, ranging from 40 to 50 feet because uh, we'll be providing a, uh, a rear yard of 30 to 40 feet uh, and then there's a setback on, on the buildings on uh, 109th Street so we provide more open space for use by the residents as well as a a larger separation and sense of openness for the residents on 109th Street. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention about the project, in addition to some of the functional things I've talked about, Wispish is very committed to sustainable green design, and we envision this building to be very green. We're looking at designing the building in accordance with passive house principles which really min minimize energy use and the impact of the building on the environment as well as creating a healthier environment for the residents. 
Um, the two points I'd like to add is a very important uh, aspect of this building for Wisfish is that it not be an insular building. We want it to be a building that will be sort of open to the community and engage with the neighborhood. So our plan is to actually have a active uh, community facility use in the ground floor. We don't know what that is right now, but we are um, actively talking to people and soliciting input as to what people would recommend to be that use. Um, one other thing that we've heard is that there's a desperate need for, play, for um, bathrooms associated with the playground next door and also with the um, ball fields or the, the play yards across the street. And so we've committed that we will be doing bathrooms as part of our project that will open on to the playground. So you know that we've already heard that, we've already directed the architect that that's something we're going to incorporate in the project. Um, the final thing I, I want to say um, was that we were aware that there were ambulances parking in the garage. Um, perhaps mistakenly, we, we, had, we had been told, we understood that they were actually relocating to another site in Central Park. Um, we now understand that either that's not happening as quickly or potentially isn't happening at all. Um, and so we have actually had conversations with the city and we are 100% committed to finding another location for the ambulance corps you know, so that they can continue to provide um, their services you know, to the community. So I, we apologize. We, we really thought that it was something that was really not an issue. So, um, so I guess we turn to questions at this point. Other than uh, zone, up zoning from R8B to R8A, are there any other variances or special permits that you're seeking? There is uh, one. Uh, we will be looking for a waiver of what's called the uh, rear, uh, rear yard setback. Uh, again, this gets into the details of zoning, but above a certain height, the zoning resolution requires a setback from the rear yard line, which is 30 feet from the rear lot line. And because we're stepping the building back to create a more interesting frontage on 108th Street, for a portion of the building, we would need uh, relief from the rear yard setback requirement. Is it ever less than 30 feet? No, it's never less than 30 feet. My name is Jessica Katz. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Special Needs Housing at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, I'm here to answer any questions folks have about HPD's involvement in the project. These are HPD-owned lots. So they're at least two garage operators on a month-to-month -month lease at this point. And as land has become more and more scarce throughout the city to build affordable housing, um, we're you know scouring all the opportunities that we have to provide affordable housing here at this site, particularly on the Upper West Side, where, as you know, there's almost no um, affordable housing opportunities left. So we partnered with Wishfish, who's one of our you know, best and most trusted affordable housing partners, particularly here on the Upper West Side, and have devised a variety of different options for you. Um, last time I was here, I was heavily, heavily pregnant, and so now I'm happy to be here. Much more comfortable to be standing in front of all of you than the last meeting. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Just for HPD, could you go over the economics? Right now, do, does HPD collect revenue from the parking? And um, will there be any exchange of funds? Will the property be leased to Wish Fish, or how would that um, So yes, right now there's a lease uh, with each parking garage operator. Um, and then what this is a precursor to, what these meetings are a precursor to, is the Euler process, which is the land use disposition process that the city has to go through. So we'd be coming back here for a formal vote and advisory um, you know, information back from the community board to hear back about the ULERP application itself, which will include both the proposed rezoning, if that's where we end up, if that's the direction we end up heading, and also the disposition to Wishfish, where the city will sell the properties for $1 to Westside Federation. Do you collect the parking revenues? The parking revenue is collected by the city of New York, yeah. I don't have that exact number. I have heard, I don't know if it's true, but I have heard that those who park in these parking garages pay less than market rate. Is that true? So we also, in cooperation with Wishfish, have come up with a, uh, consulted with a transportation consultant to do a study of the existing parking. So that was intended to be the second phase of this meeting, but we can jump into that. It's up to you if you want to talk exclusively about the housing now or home for the parking. Okay. There, there's a parking study done, and we have folks here who are going to present the results of that parking study. Okay. So we're going to have some serious questions about that. But let's get yeah. through the zoning first. Any other questions about zoning? Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, you're, apply, you're, you, you're looking to go from RAB to RA, and, but not, you're not going to use a full RAA. Um, 
can I ask why? I mean, what, what was the decision made? Why not go the way versus just part of it? Um, what we tried to balance was that um, there was an interest on both part of the city and on Wisfish and I think of the community board to see what would be additional affordable housing units that could be provided in the project. Um, what we did was we looked at this very unique site. This block has a lot of open space. And we asked, you know, working with our architect, we asked, you know, what is a building that we actually would feel be appropriate for this site? The full build out of R8A we frankly thought was too big. And so we, and this was the subject of our, of our meeting with the community board back in December, we discussed, you know, sort of this could be the full build of RA day. We all agreed we thought that was too large. And we, you know, showed different options of what we thought was actually an appropriate build out for the block, but that would end up providing, you know, significant additional affordable housing units. So, I mean, it was, and the idea is that in the, um, in the transfer of the property from the city to Wisfish, there would be, within the regulatory agreements, within all the you know, dozens and dozens of agreements that are signed at that time, um, regulations that would, re that would constrain the FAR to that which is proposed in the project. Mark? Transferable development rights or or uh, air rights, as it were, to the to the adjoining property on 109th Street. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I think the idea is that there would be an FAR associated with the proposed project, and then that would become the allowable FAR for the site. All right, we have um, a number of uh, people who signed up to ask questions or speak on the zoning issue. Uh, we're going to take those individuals first, uh, then we're going to have a presentation on parking and we'll take uh, people who've signed up, several thousand people who've signed up on that. Hi, I'm Lori Ann Kirst, I'm president of the Duke Ellington Boulevard Neighborhood Association, West 106 Street. It's going to take me more than two minutes to say that. Uh, right here, uh, outside the doors, been here 33 years, we first organized 25 years ago to fight the crack in this neighborhood. Then we also combined efforts with this community board as well as concerned residents north of 96th Street and citizen groups such as West Siders for Responsible Development to try to stop the march north of oversized buildings and skyscrapers coming into our neighborhood, such as the Extel Building, which is over 40 stories on Broadway and 100th Street. So what we did when we created this coalition is we petitioned the city and created a marvel of democracy in action by persuading city planning and the city and finally city council to adopt protective zoning north of 96th Street whereby we would not be inundated with oversized buildings that would dwarf the rest of our neighborhood, particularly here in Manhattan Valley that is typified by five-story walk-ups such as the one I live in across the street. This project as proposed runs totally counter to the will of the community and those of us who organized and uh, you know unanimously from the community board went on to city planning and city council and got past this protective zoning and now for an additional 78 units they want to dwarf 108th street with 11 stories that will totally cast 109 into shadow and create a terrible precedent for other homeowners and property owners here to build up higher my name is ira version and i just live in the area my daughter went to Booker T. Washington School. I, I agree with what the previous speaker said about casting a shadow on the street, uh, on the um, buildings behind. This, the sun in this area of the world comes from the south. The buildings are on the, uh, on the south, so the buildings below are out of luck. So anyway, second thing, as far as good neighbor policy, I don't know how, what the assumptions are that that's gonna be improved by having a, a bunch of a block based on stay-at-homes, will, will the streets be shoveled? What does that mean? What, why more street activity? I don't understand that. Third thing, uh, what the assumptions are behind the, um, uh, I, well, I said the, the area has got no possibilities for affordable housing. I don't think that's so true. I think, there, I think this is a very uncreative proposal. Uh, third thing, the Red Oak happens to back onto 107th Street. Uh, it has a fence there and it has a, a brick wall that's totally graffitied up. And the usual method of stopping graffiti is by painting it. 
That wall has not been painted in 20 years. You can go on Google Maps and, and see. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Medvedev. I live here on 106th in Amsterdam. And I feel Wispish has, is doing a fantastic job at pro providing affordable housing for our community. They've been doing this for 25 years, and it's a very important thing. They are not required by the city zoning to do this, okay? I'm for ZQA, I'm for mandatory inclusionary housing, but we have an ecological disaster occurring in our community by not fixing the parking problem. The parking problem is very important. We don't have a comprehensive plan. St. John the Divine is building housing, affordable housing. No zoning needed to change that. They're doing it on their own. So is Wispish. The city's not doing their job. We need a municipal parking in this community. We do not have a situation, well, it's been said we have subsidized parking, but we have subsidized parking in, in uh, Frederick Douglass Housing, 100th Street, 101st Street in Manhattan Avenue, and 104th Street. That's subsidized parking, and it's a lot less than they're paying at 108th Street, okay? That has to stop. It's community land. We need municipal parking. We need a policy. Um, I would like to close by saying there's the Great Sparrow War. The Chinese government decided that they want to increase uh, agriculture. So what did they do? They killed all the sparrows. And when they killed all the sparrows, the sparrows ate the insects that ate, that ate the, the agriculture. People died because of that. There's no comprehensive plan going on here. We need a comprehensive plan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Pradam. I, I work with the Northwest Central Park Multi-Block Association. We've been an organization in this area for some 30 years. Um, I'd like to just second Gloria and Kirstein's comments about a precedent for a variance. I'm opposed to a precedent for the variance. Elizabeth Kellner, 39 year resident of Manhattan Valley, uh, parking in one of the garages since 1992. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, I agree with the comments about zoning. Uh, very concerned about the precedent. Wispish, who I adore, I'm having a terrible crisis of conscience here. I've been coming to community board meetings for all 39 years, and I have supported every facility in my neighborhood. And I've testified against co-locations of charter school and infill at Douglas Houses, in favor of landmarking, bike lanes, etc. So for me, this is very difficult, but it's too much. Um, Wispish has seven sites within six blocks of this garage. The bridge has four sites within six blocks of this garage. Samaritan House has two sites within this. Urban Pathways has a huge site at 104th and Amsterdam and is set to open another one on 105th Street and we have the Icorn Center. We have dozens of HDFCs in this neighborhood. We have the NYCHA projects. We have Sojourner Truth subsidized housing at 105th uh, and the Voice of America shelter at 104th in Broadway plus many MVDC managed buildings. This community has welcomed affordable housing. We have hundreds and hundreds of units. It has to be built somewhere else. And I can't emphasize how difficult this is for me. Yeah. But the okay, um, I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to speak today. Um, had, this, had the proposal that had been pushed a number of years ago to sell these garages. Um, gone through, um, it's most likely that we wouldn't be talking here at all today. We would have luxury housing similar to what happened with the uh, stables down in the 80s. Um, number People with HPD stopped that from happening and I'm really pleased that we've got a chance to go from subsidized parking to subsidized housing. It's going to be important for Columbus and the, um, uh, the Wispish to um, have a community advisory board to look at the community space and to look at the parking further, um, and I'll stop at that.
Hi, my name is George Melendez. I've been a long time, I've always lived in the Upper West Side. I've seen the good and the bad of the only about the West Side. One question to HPD is very simple. There was an audit by Scott Stringer that came out last week, and they said they have 1,311, the city has 1,311 sites which could house 57,000 people. You have seven lots in this neighborhood alone that could easily house 500 units. Why isn't those areas looked at? Why don't you have other options that you could put affordable housing? And also, do you have an alternative for 620 cars to be dumped and put a big foot, carbon foot into our neighborhood? On top of the carbon foot, you're looking at losing the income that the city is getting from the garages and the income that's coming out of taxes at 20% per car. What is the alternative? Uh, yeah, I'll be brief. I'm Jean Jawarik, and I'm with the Northwest Central Park Multi-Block Association. I've been involved with Debna as well. That's based here on 106th Street. My big concern this evening, and the point that I hope that this group here at the board will consider very seriously, is the issue of giving a variance now. You know, we did, as Glory pointed out, there was a rezoning not too long ago, less than 10 years, I believe. And the point is that this neighborhood has a lot of institutions and organizations that are very valid in terms of what they're doing, similar to Wishfish. If they all start asking for variances, we could end up with the, the large scale, big building here on 106th Street that we worked pretty hard to keep from being built. So I don't oppose necessarily development on this site, but I am really concerned about the precedent to be set with offering a variance now. Hi there. I don't have a fancy title of any block association. I'm just a mom of four young kids, and I live on 108th Street. And three of my kids go to public school on West 93rd Street, and we walk past blocks and blocks of NYCHA housing. We walk past the cluster. We walk past the bridge. We walk past 1 and 4th Street and the playground that's there. We walk all the way up to the bridge. If we want to go to get bagels, we walk down to the bridge. We want to go to the parking, the playground, we walk past the um, Manhattan Valley. And my kids see a lot. And <coughs> there is, in my estimation, not enough there's not enough structure around what goes on outside the buildings. I'm concerned about what it means to enliven 108 Street um, as a residential property. Um, there, I call 311 and 911 on a monthly basis in that playground because there's adults without children smoking joints. There's young mothers throwing their diapers on the ground because they don't care. There are children who are not putting their trash in the cans because they need some help being guided to do so. Um, I'm concerned about a bathroom in that park, though it would be great because I've got the kids who need to use it. I know what public bathrooms in a lot of parks in New York City do and the kind of population they attract. And I'm curious about what is being put in place because almost every city park I've been to that has a bathroom has full-time staff in those parks monitoring those bathrooms and keeping them clean. So I'm just, I'm just concerned about it, what it means for street life and how it affects our families. Elizabeth Orham. I'm a geriatric nurse practitioner with the Mount Sinai Hospital and I'm here to speak on behalf of my patients because I don't hear anyone else speaking for them. My patients are elderly, frail, vulnerable, and low income. They can access good medical care. They cannot access decent, affordable, accessible housing. I have a 78-year-old gentleman with congestive heart failure. He is a prisoner his own home in a fifth story walk up. I have an 85 year old patient. She has an elevator. The four steps outside her building are an absolute barrier. She is a prisoner in her own home. I cannot believe that we are here today talking about privileging parking of automobiles over the housing of individuals. The last time I checked, there was not a human right to parking. There is a human right to decent housing. Now, I also want to say that some of my patients live in a wonderful Wish Fish facility. It's the Frederick Fleming House in Chelsea. It is an absolutely stellar facility. It is a pleasure to work with the staff there. But for that facility, I have no doubt 
that my elderly, vulnerable, and chronically ill patients would not be alive today. We need more projects like that. I have said many times to my colleagues, we need a hundred more Fleming houses. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, Willow Stelter. I live on West 90th Street, and I will save some time here. I uh, agree with the lady who just spoke and uh, Peter Arnstein. Justin Stern, followed by Jim Little, followed by Julie Herzog. Justin Stern. I'm a resident of Manhattan Valley. I parked my car on 108th Street. I am also the son of a city planner, passed on, um, and I'm a developer of housing. I'm also a big fan of Wispfish. I've, I've know, I know what, what Wispfish does, and supportive housing, the city needs uh, tremendous amounts more of it. Um, but I think what, what's very important for everyone to pay attention to is that uh, you can have your cake and eat it too in this situation. I'm friendly with the, uh, the operator uh, of the garage on 108th Street and I know, uh, I've been told that he's willing to pay for a garage to go underneath the housing um, and you can have the best of both, both worlds here. So I, 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 I think that that should be explored, um, having both worlds uh, satisfied in, in the new development. I just am curious if they thought about that. I mean, the, the, the parking garage. Is, is uh, the operator of the garage here? Is that accurate that you're willing to pay for a subterranean garage? Yes. Okay. Right, we'll, we'll get into that in the latter part of this meeting. Uh, hello, I'm Jim Little. I live uh, on 106th Street between West End and uh, Riverside, and I'm here in. Um, in, in full, complete support of what Wishfish wants to do. Uh, I, I think for my generation, for the post-World War II generation, for people who need housing, affordable housing, um, there's not enough of it in the city, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to support that in my neighborhood where I've lived for years and years and years and years. And uh, as for the comment about which I, my son also goes to a school on 93rd Street, walks the same streets and as for providing a um, an environment uh, in a neighborhood uh, I think people who know Wispish, Elizabeth Kellner, others ev everybody knows if you walk by the Red Oak you see an environment created there that's uh, really wonderful for the neighborhood so I'm um, I'm happy to support it and come to any other community meeting like that well, you've just made it very easy for me because I completely concur with what that gentleman just said. I've lived in this community for 25 years. I've walked my dog by this site 6,000 times, uh, back and forth to Central Park. Wish Fish is a wonderful partner. The city is having an affordable housing crisis. I'm a car owner. I agree with the comment that we cannot privilege cars over affordable housing for people who need it. There's a crisis in this city. When I moved here 25 years ago, there was a lot more economic diversity in this neighborhood. It was one of the things that made me feel really happy and proud to live here. And ironically, I understand that I'm part of the reason why this is all happening. And I think this is a development site that we will not see the likes of in this neighborhood. This is a really special, important site. It could have gone to private developers. It, we have the opportunity to have it go to Wishfish to do something really important for our city. And I feel really passionately they're the right people to do it. The variance shouldn't be a problem. There are a lot of other things peppered throughout this neighborhood that are as tall or higher. And I'm super excited about this. And I can't wait to walk by it. Those garages are an eyesore. Parking is not a right. Housing is right. My name is Larry Brennan. I've been in this neighborhood uh, over 35 years. I have talked to your community board before. My concern is housing is good and I'm with it. Anything that's, that's right. you know, uh, that can help anybody find somewhere to live. But my concern is when y'all do the construction, y'all building union, and all the people in the community are gonna be involved to help them be a part of this. Because so many developers they get these contracts, when they get it, they turn it back on the community. That's all I'm concerned about. We can't stop progress. Thank you. And I would like to know what I have to do. I'll bring you a thousand signatures, hundreds of people in here, show y'all that, how we feel. And I don't think it's necessary if we can talk about this, and I'd like to know who would want to give me an answer.
Thank you. So there's a lot of different concerns raised. I want to try to address as many of them um, as possible here today. So one question was about the um, the economics of the project. So one thing that's been an important uh, tenet of HPD um, <coughs> since our founding, as well as particularly now with the de Blasio administration coming in, is we are uh, we have been selling vacant HPD property to not-for-profit organizations for one dollar, regardless of its appraised value, for some time. So that's an important value that we have. It's possible we, we are able to sell it for to the highest bidder for appraised value, but that has not been our history. That's not what, been what we do, because our mission and our goal is to create as much affordable housing um, for those who need it the most. Um, another factor in the economics of the deal is the actual cost savings that supportive housing creates. So the um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene did a study of the supportive housing that we built so far under what's called the New York, New York 3 agreement to try to compare the costs for folks who've been cycling in and out of the shelter system prior to placement in affordable housing and compare all the public, public costs that accrue when someone's in and out of hospitals, in and out of shelters, on and off the streets. Um, compared to the cost after they're placed in supportive housing, and that is across the country and in New York City always been shown to save public money. So the most recent numbers on that in New York City were this Department of Health study that showed that it's about $10,000 per person per year in cost savings, and that's to compare the cost of building a building like this and having somebody live here um, versus the cost of effectively doing nothing and letting people be out on the streets and cycling through our emergency system. So that's a cost savings that we feel strongly about. It's not the only reason why we do supportive housing. We do it because it's the right thing to do. But I always like to remind folks that there's also an economic argument um, for supportive housing, which is why we've consistently gotten support for supportive housing kind of on, on both sides of the aisle, if you will, both because we think it's the moral and the right thing to do for folks who have served our country, who have been living on the street, who are seniors in the community, as well as it is simply cheaper than the alternative, which is to do nothing at all. Um, uh, could you address uh, the point that one of the speakers raised about the controller's recent report and the number of city-owned lots and why this lot is uh, essential to be, these lots are essential to be developed by Wish Vision. Sure, so this is one of the, uh, we think relatively few city-owned properties that are left remaining to be developed, and so this is one of those. Part of the reason, as you all are here to testify to, why it has not been developed so far is because each one of these lots has a very robust public process, which quite frankly, we welcome. We learn a lot in these meetings. Um, we go back and forth with the communities who know more about these lots than we could ever hope to from my office at 100 Gold Street. So we really welcome that as, as we've talked about. This is not the ULERP. It is not the place where we're voting. This is one of, I don't know, probably four or five meetings that we're having about this project in particular before we even enter into a ULERP process. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we try to be as methodical as possible about making decisions and plans about these lots. And that takes time. Um, so that's, that's one of the factors here, and that's something that we welcome, but it does postpone our ability to develop the properties versus not asking for community input. About it. The next section of our meeting tonight uh, will deal with uh, parking. Uh, when we met in December, the committees asked um, HPD and, the, and Bushfish to uh, study the feasibility of putting housing in the basement or someplace else in the proposed buildings. What did I say? Housing. Okay. Um, I, I take it there's no house trailers in this. Okay. Um, we asked you to consider uh, the feasibility of parking in the basement and also to give us some idea as to what um, parking is available, alternative parking, uh, within a reasonable radius of the, this site. Uh, we, uh, we received a study by Nelson Nygaard, which if it's not on our website, uh, will be. Um, and um, it, it contains a number of statistics, among them that there's, there are 1,900 uh, parking monthly parking available monthly parking spaces in garages within a 12 block radius of the site unfortunately the study does not disclose how many of those 1900 spaces are available now and how many of them are already spoken to. so 
Um, and and uh, you know, so, so in your presentation, if you can address that very sensitive issue, that would be appreciated. Also, um, there is a section in here that talks about the feasibility of building down. Um, and if you could talk about whether the willingness of the uh, garage operator to foot the bill uh, changes your conclusion. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sabe Bent with Nelson Nygaard. We're a transportation uh, planning firm. And we do a lot of uh, transportation uh, planning and engineering analyses. In this particular case, we're focused on parking, but we also cover lots of other ways of getting around. Um, what we did, what we were asked to do is three main things. One, figure out how many spaces are currently housed in the parking facilities on 108th Street. Um, the answer to that is about 675. Uh, how many, uh, how well are they used? Um, we, what we did is called an occupancy study, and we found that there's, there's some variety according to how the, the three garages are used. And because they are valet, uh, it's more, in, in some cases, more than 100%, uh, depending on which garage. But it's between 70 and 115%. Um, and on average, they're about 93% used or occupied. Um, we were also asked to look at how much parking is available uh, in the, the broader neighborhood. That number is actually 3,500 spaces. I'm not sure where the, where the 19 um, came from, um, but it's it's a fair number of spaces in the broader neighborhood. Um, on average, broader neighborhood. Fine, fine. Um, it, we did uh, about a 12 block radius. And what we found um, that again is that there there are about 3,500 spaces. Um, there was a question earlier as that information I, is. Folks, folks, we've been very good so far. I know this is a hot button issue, but you, we're not going to get anywhere unless one person at a time talks. So in everybody's going to have a chance to be heard. I'm not going to list all the different places. In the report, it lists all of the garages that we surveyed and the number of spaces that were available at those garages. And, and to be clear, that's the number of spaces that are supplied, not the, the occupancy of those garages. That would have been a much uh, more in-depth study that we didn't actually conduct because it was not part of our uh, task. The third thing that we were asked to do is look at how much parking is available on site. Uh, at the new sites, or how much parking could be incorporated into the new site. And we looked at the actual space that's available, the, the uh, length and width of the area, and then looked at how far down we could go. Um, what we found is that, unfortunately, we can't get to the same number. Um, we did uh, analysis to figure out what we could do with uh, simple self-park, valet parking, uh, mechanical stackers, sort of many different types of, of iterations of how the parking space could be managed and found that the maximum that we could get uh, going down about uh, up to two levels would be uh, about 118 spaces. That's a, a very different number from what you're accustomed to seeing. And uh, we also looked at the cost of doing that and it's a, it's a pretty extensive cost. It could be uh, definitely the, the double digits and you know tens of millions of dollars. We expect that it would be up to seventeen uh, million dollars, and that's just the construction cost. Then you add in the operating costs, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes uh, a, a much greater endeavor. Um, with that, I can answer any questions that people may have, or I don't know if uh, HPD would like to comment or whisper. Questions. Anything else? Oh, yeah. uh, the, the number, the 3,000 some odd spots, does that include street parking as well? They were garage spaces. So the number of parking spaces is much, much larger. Did you get a sense of what that number is? We did not count block by block how many spaces are available. Would it be, I'm just curious, do you, would you, your estimation would be a multiple of that? For sure. Okay. So we're talking like well over 10,000 spots. I'm not going to go with that number. I'm not going to throw a number out um, because I'm not, you know I'm not going to do the math on, on the spot. But uh, but it doesn't. The bottom line is it doesn't include any on street parking. It does not. And again, that's supply, right. not necessarily how uh, I have a question. Um, Excuse me, I'm in the middle of it. What? Excuse me. Oh. I understand that the. Um, parking lots that are currently 
on those sites charge below market. Is that true? I see that you have numbers in your study, but I don't know if those are below market. So what we found is, um, and you all know this, that people are paying less than $20 a day typically, and we found that that's about uh, half of the market rate, given all the other parking garages that are available in the, the area. The study actually says it's about 50% of market rate. I forget what page it's on. Uh, excuse me, that's not the process. We're going across and then... Yeah, uh, excuse me. Please. Can I? Uh, Please. I'd like to ask a question. Um, the um, to park under the to uh, uh, plan on parking under the uh, uh, open space uh, under the playground area. Um, you determine only two levels. You can go down. Is that the, uh, were studies made of the um, of the subsurface conditions and. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be able to go down three, maybe four levels? The study is only about parking under these in garages themselves, not under the park, not under the playground. And the, the reason that we didn't go further down is we actually don't have subsurface studies, and it's not something that's being conducted anytime soon. Um, if you were to go down deeper, it would be more expensive, and the you know the more expensive it becomes to deliver additional parking, the more likely that you would actually have to build up uh, higher <coughs> to get more units so that you could make a, a better financial uh, you know, pencil out, basically. So at the end of the day, the deeper you go, the higher you go in order to make it work. Well, that's not necessarily true. It depends on the subsurface conditions. And it seems to me that the goal is to keep the open space and try to find as much room for parking as you can. And if you haven't made any studies of what the subsurface conditions are, I don't think you're, you're there yet. Whatever we found in the subsurface conditions report, which we'll have to do as we move forward with a development like this, the, 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 the deeper we excavate, the more expensive it's going to be regardless. There's no scenario where digging down 10 stories of parking is going to be less expensive than digging down two stories of parking. So the first two were their first cut. Even those are not financially feasible, which tells us that going deeper and deeper and deeper is also not going to be. And again, the study was not, I don't want to, everybody in this, nobody in this room needs a study for, a, we didn't hire a consultant to tell us that there's going to be, that there are fewer parking spaces as a result of the development that we're proposing, right? I don't, you guys would laugh me out of the room if we said that. The study wasn't to say, just kidding, this is not a problem, we're not losing parking spaces. There are going to be fewer parking spaces as a result of this moving forward. What we were looking to do was see what alternative parking garages currently exist in the neighborhood. Um, to get a feel for what alternatives might be out there and to confirm what we thought, which is that these are very, these are deeply subsidized units. And again, it's a trade-off that we've all been talking about here today is subsidized parking versus subsidized affordable housing. So it's not to, it's not to minimize the question of who's in. people out of the neighborhood. People who have those spots have to work. And that's why they need a car. Anybody who speaks now is not going to be able to speak Sir, sure. have to pay an extra four hundred sure. a month out of their pocket. You know, He's not allowed. Sir, please stop talking. Um, uh, has Nelson Nygaard done any study of who is using the on-street parking spaces? Are they visitors? Are they all residents? And how much? How many spaces could be recovered if there were residential parking permits? We did not examine on-street parking spaces because it's our understanding that this is a. a focus on the garages, which are off-street spaces. So you, you don't have an idea how many might be recovered if there were residential parking permits in the area? We did not examine that. I, uh, I have to say, you know, in December we asked for information about parking, and I have to say that this report is not doesn't satisfy the questions that we asked. We want to know, and, and I, it's, it's, it, it is inconceivable that the city of New York, not necessarily HPD, but maybe Consumer Affairs, cannot get us information about available spaces. 
We know what vacancy rates are in apartments. We should know what vacancy rates are in the garages. That doesn't mean that we won't approve wish fish if we can't satisfy every partner, but it's something that the board is entitled to know and the community is entitled to know. Moreover, uh, we are entitled to have a more in-depth and no pun intended study of subterranean uh, conditions so that, uh, because I'm not sure that it's necessarily the case that if you bring in excavation, that excavating an additional 10 feet is more expensive than excavating the first 10 feet. That's not intuitively obvious to me. Additionally, uh, I think the board would like to have a very specific proposal with drawings and with uh, a budget. Uh, from the operator, uh, including how the operator plans to finance what they plan to do. Uh, is, is that possible? Can we get that? Okay, we can get it. Yeah, that's what we need. I'll, we'll be in touch with them. Anyone else on the board? Um, <clears throat> I'm interested and kind of intrigued by the um, it's intuitive that, uh, to me, that uh, the city would have uh, taken responsibility for relocating the ambulance services. But now we see that uh, it would be incumbent on the uh, development, um, the sponsor, uh, to pick up that responsibility. It just seems counterintuitive to me. This is city property. That we, it's, a, it's a very important uh, community service. And uh, if we go ahead with this project, this must be done. They have to go somewhere. And if we're not going to go deeper and park them down there or something, so, uh, the, what's the thinking? What's the raison for uh, for that shift in my intuitive thinking? Sure. No, I, I agree with you completely. I don't think it's incumbent upon which fish, at least not on their own, to do so. Um, as we've we've had a series of meetings about uh, this project in particular, and I think there was a there was an assumption about a plan in place for the relocation of the ambulances, and now we have a group of people here to talk to us about that not being the case. And so I literally spoke to the Parks Department today, so we're very grateful for the very important service that the Ambulance Corps provides, and we're absolutely going to continue a conversation and partner with you on figuring out an alternative location for the ambulances. One question sure. first. Um, I would like to request that HBD um, involved the Parks Department and City DOT in do a more comprehensive study of the transportation and the parking in the larger neighborhood and look and see if it's feasible at all to put a parking garage under the playground and or the school yard. Okay, thank you. Uh, two, two more speakers on housing. Uh, John, uh, Carl Scalise followed by John Moscow. Hello, my name is Carl Joseph Scalisi. I live at West 109th Street, and by the way, I'm for housing and for parking. But the problem is this, that five years ago, the people that rent that space was given an opportunity to buy. They blew it. So now we have a situation where we need housing. So I prefer housing right now, and also the board and the community in general neglected to press Columbia University when they built housing to build parking. So that's my opinion and that's the story. And thank you very much. Thank you. My name is John Moscow. I've lived here, lived here since 1948. It's good. I went to PS165. I know the neighborhood reasonably well. It is a neighborhood. In a neighborhood, you need all sorts of services. You need all sorts of things. A plan which called for the abolition of dry cleaners and laundromats would probably have an impact on everyone's life. We're talking here about a plan which says, let's get rid of 675 cars, as though that did not have to do with the housing of the people who are living in the neighborhood who parked their cars there. It's saying, we have a specific demand, so let's screw up the life for the people who live here. When I hear numbers like, 115% in a garage. I think about the people driving into St. Luke's Hospital who need a place to park their cars. I wasn't particularly focusing on the teachers. I was thinking about the hospital. People live here. It is a neighborhood. It needs a balance of services. And abolishing cars and saying that 
there's a garage at 120th Street, and if you live at 90th Street, it's only 12 block radius from where you are. That really doesn't work. You're getting a little bit, some of us are getting a little bit old, it just doesn't work. So I suggest that in terms of living here, we have to focus on a balance, not just a project. And we're going into the speakers on parking. Um, Thomas Powell, followed by Louise Egbert, followed by Fred Rodriguez. Thank you everyone for attending. I've been involved with this neighborhood for Raul Guidos. I've been involved with this neighborhood for 33 years. It's a working class community. A lot of people, a lot of jobs in those garages, but more importantly, all those spaces are occupied by people who have to go to and from work at any God-given hour. And we don't have the luxury to spend half an hour or an hour looking for parking on the street. And when they say it's below market value, in theory, parking should be free in New York City. It used to be when I was growing up. So when you're telling me $400 below market value, we're spending $400 of our disposable income just to be able to access to our car so we can go to work to keep paying the increasing taxes, the increasing standard of living in this city, and there's no consideration for the working class neighborhood that is already there. And as the gentleman before me said so eloquently, it is absurd that they just want to put more congestion into this neighborhood, which is congested as it is already, and not take into consideration the working habits of the people who are there and have been there for 20 or 30 plus years. Thank you for your time. This is a bad idea. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Louise uh, Egbert Johnson. I've lived in the neighborhood since 1980 on 106th Street. Um, and I have big concerns about this project on, basically, I'll try to be brief, on four things. Uh, the first issue is parking. Uh, you're gonna take 100 and 675 spaces and they're going to go onto the street. And I look at the people from the Icorn Center across the street from me, saving the street parking so that they can go to work. So we're not just talking about people who are living here, we're talking about people who come into the neighborhood to work, who are taking up the street parking. There is no parking now on the street that's available. There was when I first moved here, but that's not the case anymore. So, and when I look at the study, that you said it was 19% of the parking from 96th Street to 120th from Central Park West to Riverside Drive. So you're talking about taking nearly 20% of the available parking away. So that's, you know, so I'm very concerned about the parking. My next concern is that this is a working class neighborhood and my daughter cannot find an apartment that she can afford in this neighborhood, but she does not meet the income levels of the subsidized, I'm sorry, I, I'll be fast. She does not meet the income levels of the, of the affordable housing. So a single person has to make 36,000, can't make more than $36,000 a year to have affordable housing in this working class neighborhood, which is losing its middle class housing. And so that means a teacher can't get into affordable housing here, and they also cannot afford housing here. Now, and that was not true 30 years ago, but that is true now. My, next, my other concern is everybody's concerned about the zoning and the variances, and there were a lot of variances given to the Towers Nursing Home, which everybody loves because it's cleaned up the neighborhood. But you know, the neighbor, our, our community was promised a swimming pool, a community room, uh, you know, we were co promised a great deal, and over the years, all everything was taken away. Thank you. And, um, and that's, I guess, it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There is certainly no way that one can argue against the need for affordable housing. But there is also no way anyone can argue that this program is, by taking away 20% of the parking, by adding on this to the congestion on the streets is going to be a good thing. I would much prefer that what we start with is the perspective that we have to somehow find a way to handle both. Now maybe that means building higher and giving up certain aesthetic things. Maybe it means a little bit of, un of building underneath. Maybe the playground, which in all honesty, I never knew existed, and I've only been here since 1972. 
Uh, maybe that one needs to be looked at too. But I think somehow the underlying assumption needs to be that there are two problems. We're not going to try and say that one side is better than the other side. We're going to try and meet as many needs as we possibly can. Thank you. Uh, hi, Stephen Miner. I've been here for about 30 years. Um, I agree with the, uh, the, the, the gentleman over here who talked about the, uh, the doctors up at the, uh, St. Luke's and that, that we are a working class uh, community. Um, and I really feel that Manhattan Valley, this area, we have done enough in regards to providing um, you know, supportive housing that you know, not only for the rest of Manhattan, but you know, a lot of the other parts of New York City and why we seem to be being singled out. Um, and that, I don't think that's very fair. Yeah. I'm Rich Failer. I'm just an ordinary person who's been on the Upper West Side since 1971. Sometimes with the car, sometimes without, currently with. Uh, over that time, I've seen a lot of apartment buildings go up. I haven't seen that many garages go up. Uh, I think if we lose these garages, they aren't going to be replaced with other garages, right? And over time, we've been losing progressively street parking for various and sundry reasons. I don't know whether anyone's noticed, but I've noticed over the last 40 years that street parking has been disappearing, right? So I think we really need the parking. Uh, I think we need the affordable housing too. But my suggestion would be, we have a lot of apartment buildings. Let's take some of them, renovate them, and turn them into affordable housing. Let's stop buying. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to come here. I have some good news for you, which is New York City is home to the best hospitals in the country, in the world. That's something we all know, but getting to the hospital sometimes, if you have the best ERs in the room, what good are they if you can't get to them fast? So, I am with the Central Park Medical Unit. We are a volunteer ambulance. I just want to take you back in time for a little bit. Going back to 1975, anyone have any idea how long it would take to get an ambulance into Central Park? 20 minutes. I'll tell you, no, not 20 minutes. 45 minutes to an hour and a half. That's the point that the Central Park Medical Unit was founded, and we cut that response time to, on average, three minutes or less. So now, let's fast forward to today. So we're 41 years later. We have four ambulances, a Polaris Ranger, we have medic bike teams, and we have more than 150 very diverse volunteers. By that I mean there is no paid staff. Everyone who is on the medical unit is at least an emergency medical technician, a paramedic, a physician, or higher. So, there's a lot of training that people have to go through that. I remember when I first took my training, we have to do, you know, six months to a year of going two to three to four times a night, a week, to get certified. There's a practical exam, there's a state exam, it's pretty grueling. So, what I want you to all know is that everyone who's on the medical unit is extremely dedicated. They're doing this for free, they're not getting a paycheck. They're there because they want to help you. So. I want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the garages on 108th Street. They have allowed us to park there for more than 10 years for free. So, thank you. Thank you to the garage operator for allowing us to do that. And in so doing, they have kept us in a climate controlled environment with access to electricity to keep all of the batteries charged, all of our systems going, so that if there's ever a disaster in New York, we can pull out those ambulances immediately and they'll be on the road heading out to whatever disaster might hit us, whether before in years past we were at the World Trade Center in 1993, 2001, uh, the, the blizzards, anything that might occur, even uh, airplane crashes, we're out on the road almost immediately, and that's because of the readiness of our vehicles which is something that, quite frankly, we would not be able to do without the garage on 108th Street. Time here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, my time is up. I thank everyone for allowing me to come and speak, 
And if you have any questions, I will be in the back of the room with some of the other volunteers. After the meeting, please feel free to come and, and chat. Thank you. like you to add to your homework list, uh, just keeping us abreast of your discussions with the CPMU and what, what's being offered, what's available, etc. Et Don't wait for the your, you know, but let us know, and if there's anything we can do, let us know that too. Uh, Nancy Brenner. I'm not with CPMU. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board. I'm not with CPMU. My son is a volunteer EMT with him, but because he's in a rehearsal tonight, he's soloing with an orchestra, he couldn't come. We thought it was important enough that I should come in his place. And I will say that let's look at, you know, there's one good versus another good, but what Raphael said, think of millions of people, New York City residents, residents of this community, visitors to New York, who use Central Park every year, and who are served by the Central Park Medical Unit and you know would be in bad shape without it. And when there was a fire uh, with the ambulances and they were looking for, at least temporarily, for alternate parking, I'm not a consultant, uh, you know, and I'm not with the city, but I went around and I, I Googled and I went around and I looked and I drove around to try to see if I could just, in a very casual way, locate alternate parking, either on the west side, on the east side, north of the park, and I, that would fit these ambulances, which are specially made so that the reason the response time is so low is because they are a special size so they can go under underpasses and into places in the park that FDNY cannot fit. And I could not find anything. And I'm kind of appalled just having been trained in business and analysis at Harvard Business School that this issue was not more fully thought out before this meeting tonight. I'm sorry. Thank you, Board. Uh, I'm a resident here also probably of 20 years. Um, I was reading the, uh, the parking report and I noticed that uh, it kind of suggests, it doesn't say conclusively, but it does say that in order to uh, do this parking subgrade, uh, the cost of a monthly rate for a parking space would be between $1,300 and $2,000 a month. I don't know what neighborhood you're living in, but I don't think that's really feasible. So I'm a little worried that this is never going to kind of go off the ground. You know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, secondly, I'm an architect. Uh, the, the geography or the typology of this area is Manhattan Schist. So the idea of digging really deep down is probably not going to work out because it's very expensive to uh, do that kind of excavation. And last but not least, um, I'd like to suggest that uh, we, you know, on-street parking is also being limited insofar as uh, we have a uh, DOT um, program in effect or being considered uh, to do bicycle lanes on Amsterdam Avenue. So all that parking on Amsterdam Avenue is going to be minimized probably by half on at least one side of the uh, avenue. So we're losing a lot of parking. And uh, you know, I'm not against you know, affordable housing, but I would also say that that block, which is uh, 1863, if those developments happen, about half of it will be uh, NYCHA and affordable housing. Uh, 109th Street, pretty much the rear, uh, rear lots, 49, 48, 47, 43, 41, 31, 37, and 29 are all affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. David Vassar. David Vassar, thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, I live in Manhattanville, just a bit north of here, and you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, with, with the protest of buildings that are a little bit too high for the neighboring community. Um, we live in the shadow of some of Columbia University's more recent constructions in, in recent years, so I kind of know that. I think what we'll see appearing on uh, Winnowate Street, uh, hope I got the street right, uh, is going to be a little more elegant looking than some of the things Columbia has, has built um, in past years. I'm really for this plan. I mean, affordable housing easily trumps cheap parking. I'm sorry, it really does. Um, this is, New York City is America's capital of mass transit. I'm really kind of dismayed by how much, how much, of, how much street space, how much city space is given over to parking. I mean, it's, it's a sacrifice of a public good. Um, I sympathize with those who come into the city and uh, 
just don't have the means or the wherewithal or access to mass transit. Um, I don't know. I, th I think somehow these folks, uh, these, these these folks who work in the community, have to be accommodated. And um, it's easy for me to suggest carpooling. You know, that's one way to cut down both on congestion in the city and your personal expense. Um, and it doesn't work for everyone. I know. I'm lucky. I live in Manhattan and work in Manhattan, which means I can bicycle. I can take advantage of the bicycle routes that are there and are and those to come, for which I'm grateful. Um, I can walk to work. Um, it's about a four mile trip. So I consider that a luxury, an incredible luxury. I don't need a car. I used to live in the southeast where I did need a car, and I wouldn't think of buying a car now even if I could afford it. So I really support this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Phil Katzman. It's an insult to everyone in this room to say that we believe garages way over affordable housing. I think everybody in this room believes affordable housing is important. But we're mixing apples with oranges here. There's a situation where we have two solid, good garages with no problem. There is a building that is housing some of these people at this point on the block that is a good building that has no problems. We're break, fixing something that's not broken at this point. It's insulting to me to say that I am over garages, over housing. No. I've been up on the Upper West Side for, 80, for 36 years now. I have moved three times, each time up a little further that I got pushed out of the neighborhood. When I finally got to the point where I can afford supposedly this cheap garage, which is costing $4,000 a year, it's not so cheap to me being a teacher myself. I have to commute out of the city to go to work. Not everybody can bicycle to work. I pay city taxes, city taxes, and if I didn't live in the city, I would not be paying those city taxes. I pay taxes for this garage. It's an unfair situation to tell us that we're looking at garages over people. It's not true. There are many places to house people. We have garages, there's nothing wrong with them. They should stay where they are. Arthur Peer, followed by Alex Nett uh, and John Moscow. Is this your rebuttal? <laughs> you want to go again? No. Okay. <laughs> and Siobhan Dolan. Hi, I'm Arthur Peer. Thank you, board. Um, I just want to say that I've lived in this neighborhood for 30 years, and I work in the city, but as a result of my job, there are times when I have to go and work outside of the city. When I work in the city, I take mass transit. I love mass transit. Mass transit is not better now than it was a few years ago, but I still take it. When I go out of the city to work, I have to have a car. There is no mass transit to where I go out of the city. I pay taxes here in the city. I live in the city, I love the city. But I think to say that we have a choice here and it's either people in affordable housing or automobiles, let's not overlook the fact that those of us who own these automobiles and are dependent on them are also people and we live here and we are the community, you are not the community, and I think we have a much better idea of what this community needs than you, or you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Siobhan Dolan. I've lived in the area for just under 30 years. And uh, I wanted to start off by thanking these fish for the work that they've done. But as I've listened, I've, I've heard one speaker uh, speak of, I don't know, 20 some odd social services and affordable housing that exists in the area. And I had to ask my question, is that fairly distributed to other parts of the city? I asked myself the question, what do you think the answer is? No. Um, and also, you know, with these cars, I, I do keep my car on a garage on 108th Street. The cars are not just a piece of metal junk. 
the, these cars are enlivening, enlivening that word, to the people who use the car, cars, over 700 people who depend on these cars for their livelihood to get out of the city because they can't take transportation to get to Connecticut, wherever they are, or in New Jersey, and they need their cars for this. Um, and also the other point is that it's mostly middle class people who are using these garages who cannot afford garages elsewhere because it's too expensive. And according to that report, for the small percentage of of spaces that would be created, I mean, who among us can pay $1,000 to over $2,000 for a space? It's ridiculous. I apologize for mispronouncing your name, Ms. Dolan. Uh, Michael Feldman, Dan Cohn. I've lived in this neighborhood for about 20 years. Um, I just found out about this, more or less. You know, it's, um, it seemed to have enough public housing, as far as I can tell. They don't have any long speeches or anything else. Uh, you know, whatever compromise can be reached, it would be nice. You know, if you can find an affordable place to park and they can put the housing in or whatever needs to happen. But I just found out about this. I, I you know. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you, board. Uh, my name is Dan Cohen. I'm president of a Friends of Annabella Vila's Playground. That's the green space that's uh, between these all these garages. Um, I was on CB7 when we voted to not sell these garages about uh, someone with a better memory will remember maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people have spoken about the zoning, and really I just want to talk about the, the potential improvements, uh, at least if there's any changes at all, because if you're in the playground right now, at night it becomes sort of a den of, of, of iniquity, uh, of, of people using drugs or other activities. If there are windows from housing on either side of it, it will vastly improve what's currently a sort of place in shadow. But um, there also should be some sort of sense of you give and you get. If, if the community is going to lose all of these parking spaces and they're going to be building a much taller building, then maybe there should be more parking below grade. Maybe we don't get everything we want, maybe we get something, but it feels like some sort of trade, because right now it feels like we're just sort of losing. And I don't know if it's really fair for the people who are, care about the parking and the people who care about the housing to feel like they're against each other. I think we all would try and find some sort of compromise that would benefit all of us. And please keep our park. Please don't park cars underneath the park. Don't don't move the park. It's very hard to move any park. You have to get a legislation from the state. It's called alienation, and it's almost impossible. Um, and you can't go underneath the park because trees are like dumbbells. They're just as big above as they are below. You'd have to cut the roots, and that would be very bad for the trees, and that makes the park. So leave leave the park as is. Please, thank you very much. How's everybody doing tonight? My name is David Calvert. I'm with the 212 West 100th Street HDFC. We squatted the building in 1980 and uh, we've been uh, part of the building up of this community ever since. I, I guess I'm one of those people that almost agrees with everybody all the time. <laughs> I mean, there's so much truth in this room. There's not a single person that came up that didn't have something important to say. And I think there's, a, there's an essence in that, and the essence is find that balancing act. We don't want to say no to affordable housing. Of course not. We need affordable housing in our city. We need it everywhere. You know, we don't want to say no to people that are parking their cars so they can go to work by, by the subway, which I do every day, or I go by bike. But I keep my car in that garage so I don't have to drive it every day. So it doesn't fill up the streets. And so it's safe in a place so I can take my kids on a play to some place on the weekend. I mean, I think that's the way these garages work. They, they keep the cars off the street, they keep them safe, and they pay a cost that the city collects. And that cost is important too. I think the balancing act has to be something like this um, underground parking, but not just two stories down. Take it down as far as it has to go. Take it down five stories. That increases the cost of the project, of course it does, but it also increases revenues on the project. Because every time, every month, there's no operating cost to those garages because they're paid by the people that park there. There's 700 cars paying right now, every month, and those same cars will want to be there and there will be future generations that will need that parking space. So find the space that way. New York always finds solutions by going up and going down. We don't have any sideways to go. So let's just build something that works for everybody. Thanks a lot. I first want to say thank you to Board 7 for coming up to our neighborhood to have this hearing, making it easy for all of us to come and, and talk with you. 
I uh, personally think Wish Fish is a great neighbor. And I think Wish Fish bringing seniors in supported housing into our neighborhood will make our neighborhood a better place. These are good people. Wish Fish is a good provider. And maybe it's because I'm getting up there myself, getting grayer and grayer by the minute. But having seniors in the neighborhood is a good thing. It's good for all of us. They're regular people, real people like you and me. Second thing is, this is not cars versus housing. This is not that. And we must reject HPD's attempts to cast it as such. If you look at this uh, study, thanks for putting it up on the website. I read it and thought about it a lot. These costs that are allegedly going to be the cost of building these parking spots at $1,400 a month, they'd have to charge $1,400 a month. Well, if that's what it costs, to build parking spaces in this neighborhood, why aren't all these garages, many of whom, many of which were recently built, why aren't they charging $1,400 a month? Yeah. Why not? Obviously, they were able to build parking for a good deal less. And also, you know, I outright reject the notion that this is subsidized parking. It's not. If you look at the costs of these garages compared to the other garages in the radius, they are on the low end, but they are within the range of what is charged on a monthly parking spot. <laughs> Finally, I want to ask Board 7, and Richard, I'm glad you started asking those kind of questions. What is the impact on the environment and the health of all of us who live here of dumping almost 700 cars on the neighborhood and having those 700 cars coursing through the neighborhood for hours, and I tell you, it is hours I've done it, looking for a parking spot. Used to be you had to measure the impact on health and the environment before you jammed everybody with a big change in traffic. We need to know what those costs are because as the people from Wish Fish said and from the Department of Health, there is a health cost to homelessness, but there is also a health cost to cars coursing through the neighborhood idling, looking for any opportunity to find a parking spot. And let's look at the whole cost of this. Let's get the rest of the information and let's get an unbiased study of the true impact and cost of building parking spots for people in this neighborhood. Thank you. Frank, Dr. Kale. Hi, my name is Frank Kale. Uh, I want to make two points. One, uh, I reject, and I hope we all, all reject, opposing the need for low-cost housing, affordable housing, however you call it, and affordable parking. I park my car on 108th. I've been doing it for probably uh, 20 years. I've lived in the neighborhood since 1964, raised my family here. One son is an EMT, former EMT, now a nurse uh, on the Shelburne, Vermont Rescue. The other son uh, lives at home still, uh, and takes his bike to work most days, downtown. Okay, it seems to me if we reject the dichotomy of one side and the other, and you give one, you have to take away from the other, if we reject that, you come back to, okay, how can you be creative and solve the problem? Well, people have talked about different solutions. I'm an urban anthropologist, but not an urban planner. I did my studies in Hong Kong, which is the most dense place on earth, and which has a lot of creativity in the way it's handled a whole series of things. One example in our area is how you've got a sewer tre sewage treatment plant at Riverside Riverbank Park and everything else on top of it that serves the neighborhood. That's creativity. I think we can do the same thing here by going down and going up. And I think it's pretty clear as a researcher that the study that was done, I don't know what mandate they were given, I sympathize with 
people who do such studies, because I've done them, I don't know the mandate that they were given, but not every base was covered, not every I was dotted and T crossed, and we need to go back and ask sharper questions, and then be creative and think about how we can manage the competing needs so that everybody is served. Think about the Riverbank Park example. I think the uh, recent uh, comments of this gentleman uh, make a great deal of sense. Um, just one point of reference, the um, architect for the project um, is the same architect that did um, the Riverside Park, so maybe there's some uh, idea here that could be used in, in um, dealing with both the housing and the parking. Uh, Ron Hoffman. Riverbank Park. Yeah. I, Beth Oram, Rebecca Parrell, Parwell, and Mimi Torchin. Hi, my name is Ron Hoffman. I live on West 106th Street, Manhattan Avenue. I've been teaching in this community, District 75, for children with special disabilities. I've been teaching since 83. I've been living in the community since 84. I've seen the crack, I've seen the changes over the years. But speeding up today, I went to a meeting and I met with Assemblywoman um, Rosenthal's representative. At this meeting, at the Federation meeting, somebody asked, Affordable housing. I'm looking for affordable housing. The meeting was at West 71st Street. The representative said from Rosenthal's office, we don't have affordable housing on the Upper West Side. It's, it's so scarce, we don't have it. Coming back here, all of a sudden, affordable housing. Why is it okay to put affordable housing here? And Manhattan Valley, which we all know, is a blocked-in community that starts at 100th Street and ends at 110th Street. It is a self-contained community, and since I've been here since 84, it evolved over the years into a community where people say, oh, Manhattan Valley, that's not the Upper West Side, that's, a separate, that's Harlem. So over the years, and I don't know if it's deliberate, but an informal policy has developed with the directing of all types of affordable housing in this community within a five block area and all the social services. We have affordable housing. We have Red Oak has 230 apartments. The Shider Building has 54. 140 West 105th Street has 28. Valley Lodge has 92. A little bit more. And we also have HDFC buildings, affordable co-ops. We have Manhattan Valley Development Corporation, 18 buildings with affordable housing. We have Douglas Housing. I want to wrap up, please. We have four that we have four thousand five hundred and eighty-eight residents. I want your group, this is my community, you don't live here, to do a better comprehensive plan. Don't look at parking. Go beyond that. What is the impact on the schools here? Right. What is the impact on the business community? Our business community is dying, and I think you should look at the greater Manhattan Valley community. What you could do is come back with a real plan, not a Mickey Mouse plan of how much, house, how much parking is in the garage. That's it. Thank you. Rebecca Parnell, Parvell? Powell, forgive me. I wrote badly. <laughs> I read badly. Hi. Um, I am a legit Manhattan Valley resident. I've lived uh, since 2000 on uh, between 109th and 110th. Um, and before that, on the Upper West Side for all of my life in this uh, CB7. And I just thought that it was worth mentioning to the board that I mean, I saw along Central Park West and all around Manhattan Valley all of the flyers for this meeting about the garage. And I thought it was worth mentioning that I don't own a car. Uh, 
probably most people in this neighborhood don't. I respect that there are people who do own cars, who need places to keep them, etc. But I do have to say that this is kind of a minority concern. And I think that affordable housing is something which is important to the entire community, much more so. So that was really all I had to say to speak up for the non-car owners and the pro-affordable housing people. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mimi Torchin. Hi, um, I've been listening to all of these uh, sides and I agree with a lot of what everybody says, of course, but I want to talk about three things. I I've been in Manhattan Valley for uh, 30 years. I live on West 107th East. Uh, I live in a block of uh, mostly Section 8 buildings. I pay market value. The people above me pay at least half of what I pay, to the right of me the same, below me to the same, and across the hall from me to this, the same. These buildings are strewn all through the city, and I do believe that that is a form of affordable housing, which I pay market value to help support along with my taxes. So there is a lot of affordable housing that is not labeled affordable housing in Section 8. Uh, the other thing is, is I'm not a rich person. I'm a senior citizen. I live on savings and uh, my social security. I have a 17-year-old car that I need, that I park at 108th Street. I share a, a little bit with a friend, so she helps me pay the $400 a month extra parking because I pay market value in my basically Section 8 um, uh, uh, apartment which is not so great, but I'm happy to have it. The third thing is, I don't know how many of you or you live on uh, the eastern fringes, the higher areas of uh, Manhattan Valley. It's kind of rough in places. And uh, 600 extra cars, and probably extra cars in um, the new buildings, right? It's not all just uh, elderly people without cars. There will be new cars coming in, there will be fights on the street. I see it now. Yeah. People fighting over parking spaces. Yeah. 600 or 700 new cars in our neighborhood and no place to put them will cause violence. I have seen it. I have lived with it. And um, those are just the things I would like to add to this. Thank you. I, uh, I left out uh, Rafael Castellano the Younger, thinking that he was the same person as his father, which I am told he is not. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael Castellanos, and I have been a volunteer EMT with the Central Park Medical Unit for more than six years. Um, I'm an emergency medical technician, and I'm a driver. Um, I would like to tell you a little story today about just after Christmas 2010, um, there was a major blizzard. New York City was paralyzed. Hundreds of city FDNY ambulances were out of operation because they were stuck in the snow. And if you had a cardiac arrest and you called 911, you would end up waiting hours for an ambulance, sometimes longer. The city was in desperate straits. And who did they call for help? They called us. They called the Central Park Medical Unit, and we responded. Just like we responded on 9-11, just like we responded in Hurricane Sandy. On that particular occasion, I was working with Gary Resnick, our Chief of Operations, and we went to go get an ambulance which was not stored at the 108th Street garage. That ambulance did not start. The fuel line was frozen. Okay, the city called us for help, and we could not answer that call because our ambulances were not in a garage. All right? This is a matter of life or death that we're talking about right here. And we don't just respond to massive natural disasters or terrorist attacks. We also, re at War Central Park for that matter, we respond to this very community. We serve this community. We have responded to a cardiac arrest my partner, Freddie Chang, took someone who had a cardiac arrest out of this very facility. I would just like you all to consider that. And
and the needs of the Central Park Medical Unit, the needs of all of the people um, that we serve, that we volunteer serve before you guys destroy this garage. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, bearing in mind that this is a preliminary meeting, does anyone on the board uh, wish to say anything in final words? Or I, 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 you know, it's clear to me that a lot of work needs to be done cooperatively between now and Europe. I w it's, it's too late if you wait for Europe. There have been several things floated here. Uh, we don't have crucial information that we need. Uh, the garage operator ought to be involved in the decision making. A home has to be found for the CPMU. Uh, and our committees are available anytime. And, and we, I would hope, if we don't hear from you, we'll call you. But um, let's not wait until uh, ULERP is on us. Uh, there, it, it may well, it may be that uh, even with the information, even if the parking has to be uh, uh, done away with, that we would approve it, but it may be that we wouldn't. And you need to address the very heartfelt uh, issues that are raised tonight. Uh, we don't have a lot of crucial information. We don't know exactly what the usage is at these garages other than by percentage. We don't know how many people need their cars to go to work. We don't need how many people only use their cars on weekends. Uh, it, it, it's all important information to us, and it should be to you. I want to thank everybody here tonight it was, it was, uh, for your patience. It's, it's tough to sit through these meetings. I've been doing it for a while. This issue has to come before the community board in what is known as ULERP, or Land Use Review Procedure. Um, before it can get to us, it's got to pass through uh, city planning. Uh, city planning has to certify a plan, not approve it, but just certify that it's complete. Um, it, it probably will be several months from now, I assume. Is, is that your best? Like when? So I think in, in the, if, I think we've heard a lot tonight about other information that we want to gather and people we want to talk to first, so I don't think that we're rushing forward to do the ULERP in the earliest possible moment. So we're talking three shop. months, six months, nine months. Which uh, trimester are we in <laughs> for? Um, I think we had been hoping to certify the ULERP in late summer. Okay. Um, and we'll see whether, given all the discussion that we've had now, whether there's going to be time to do that or whether we're going to have to do that. Okay, so the earliest that this board will consider the proposal for a vote will be in the fall. Uh, once the board gets the package from city planning, we schedule first a public meeting of land use and other uh, interested committees. Uh, the, the committees will make a recommendation to the full board, and then we have a meeting of the full board uh, where the board takes a vote. Um, I have to warn everybody that the community board is, has no power other than to advise. Uh, we have sometimes, uh, we convince city agencies of things and sometimes we don't. Uh, but at each stage, at the committee meeting, and at the full board meeting, there will be a public hearing and everybody who attends will have an opportunity to be heard. My guess is that there will be a series of meetings, hopefully there'll be a series of meetings between now and the time that uh, HPD asks for certification from city planning. Um, I think it might make sense um, for us to in some way identify people who can be spokespeople and can participate in that process. Um, so, does that answer your question? No. Yes? Uh, would you care to comment on the fact that Danny O'Donnell, our state representative, has basically told us that it's a done deal? Yeah. Is this going to happen? No. Basically no. I don't, I, can't, I don't care to comment on it. As far as we're concerned, it's not a done deal. Uh, but. Could. The decision is really on 
It could, but frequently it's not. If we would like to have a voice, where do we go now? Yeah. The office of the mayor, there is an official process known as ULERP of which the community board is a required part. It is part of the legal process. Its eventual result is advisory as compared to, let's say, the city council at the end. But it is part of a process that is approximately 170 days and that may start in the fall. Right, but I understand, but what you told me is that even if the community board, even yes. if this board decides that this is a bad idea and against it, it does, the right. city does There's not no have to listen. There's no guarantee that the board... Correct. Is, so what do we do? No, uh, well, I, let me just answer that, and I, I, I don't want to get into a political discussion. No, I'm say very say bad at politics. But every, uh, the, the, the place where most people go and should go uh, is to their elected representatives, particularly city council persons. Uh, if Danny O'Donnell says it's a done deal, I don't know that you need to take him, that you need to accept that. Um, and if you have legitimate grievances, go to your city council people, go to other elected officials, uh, and do what you can. All right. So thank again. Thank you all very much. It was a very orderly meeting. I appreciate it. All right. Yes. Okay. I promised a show of hands. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, proposed plan. All right. And opposed. Okay. Thank you very much.